first of all, a warm welcome to our guests and audience. We at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation buses are very proud to be co-organizers of this very important webinar series. When last year, Helmut, who is rapporteur in the European Parliament on the trade agreement between the EU and Africa, mentioned the title EU in listening mode. For the first time in a preparatory meeting, it was clear to us that we wanted to be part of it. An event that takes into consideration the concerns, the criticism, but also the visions of our colleagues from the so-called Global South is exactly what we as a foundation have set as an important goal. This is a good opportunity to talk about fair and equitable trade in terms of distribution <coughs> and hopefully also to pour it into a legislative text. The two previous events were a success from our point of view and I'm sure the success will be repeated today and also next week. Therefore, I would like to thank Helmut for the good cooperation I would, and I would also like to hand over to him who will be the moderator of this event. Thank you, Helmut, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arif, and thank you for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for co-hosting this webinar. And you said already that is a part of a series we are dedicating to the different regional developments at the African continent, dealing with challenges and with, uh, with tasks for, for rethinking how the trade commercial investment relationship between the European Union and Africa must be shaped in the 21st century. So we have to overcome, of course, um, still, at the, at the one or the other corner to be found post-colonial approach that we should overcome this thinking. And I, I guess everybody is agreeing, including in the European Union, that our continents are so much linked uh, in view of the challenges of the next 20, 30, 40 years. So the 21st century needs different answers to shaping the economies, to shape the governance structures, to, to enable citizens to participate in the decision making. And uh, so the report I'm working on on behalf of the International Trade Committee for the European Parliament concerning the um, trade and um, investment relations is linked to this task. So a young generation at the African continent expects, of course, new answers from both from your governments in the different regions from the, uh, from, from the states of the African Union, but of course also for the trading partners, being the European Union, the 27 member states, other European countries, being the United States, China, the Russian Federation. So we are losing the voice. Whoever, do you hear me? I hope so, yeah. So um, maybe you can unmute who is not, uh, not yes. speaking, uh, would be helpful. And uh, so this is, this is a, the question. And therefore I really have Uh, Helmut, yeah. Helmut, just one second. We can't hear you. I'm not sure what the technical issue now is, but we are trying to fix it. Do you hear me now? Now we can hear you, yeah. We didn't get your last minute uh, speech. Okay, uh, so sorry. Um, um, I said that um, I'm really looking forward to an interesting exchange of view with all the panelists, which I will introduce one after the other uh, in the in, the, um, in, in our panel debate. But let me make one, one specific aspect uh, to, to, to raise. There had been the dignity revolution 
in your countries in the northern part of Africa, belonging also to the Mediterranean Union. Almost nobody is today speaking about the Mediterranean Union in the European Union. So this project is somehow scientifically disappeared from the public attendance. But of course, all the problems, all the tasks for the Mediterranean Union for accompanying a, 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 a partnership a relationship between the European Union and the African countries is of course on the stake. So what is your uh, analysis of the outcome of the dignity revolution where we are today? What does it mean for shaping the future relationship between the European Union and um, uh, the, the North African uh, countries? And therefore, I would give the floor immediately to Dr. Saka Elnur. He is a visiting postdoctoral fellow um, from the Global Scholarly Dialogue Program of the Luxembourg Foundation. He is also from the Otto Suhr Institute of Political Science at the Freie University in Berlin. And I have, I have asked him in particular uh, to speak on the nexus of EU Africa and intra African trade relations and the need for agriculture policy transformation, as well as to cover possibilities uh, of a just transition in the agriculture sectors in Nigeria, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia in particular. Dr. Saka Enwa, the floor is yours. And Thank you very much. Try to keep 10 minutes because our experience is always the time pressure at the end of the webinar so that we have the chance also to to um, to listen and to to discuss so the floor is yours okay thank you i just uh, start by sharing my uh, my screen um, put it in this way So you see my presentation now? Yes, we see a presentation and I have also to make the remark that there is a French translation available in the chat room. Okay. Uh, as I said, thank you for the invitation. Uh, in this presentation, I discussed the relationship between trade agreement and the possibility of building a local based just transition for North African agriculture. Uh, I would like to share some general idea and raise question and generate a discussion. So I try to make it short to have more discussion. Uh, the presentation is organized in three main parts. First, I, I, I will give a small, uh, a small, uh, I give small idea about just transition from a global South perspective. Then I talk about the evolution of agriculture policy dynamics in North Africa and the European trade agreements impact on North African food system. And finally, I uh, elaborate some suggestions to build a just transition for North African agriculture. Um, just transition refers to a, a set of principles, process, and practice that create shift away from uh, an extractive economy toward a global equal low carbon economy. And uh, at the, in the last decade, there is more debate about the just transition increasingly move through wide sector and circle to build a global just transition and rethinking the slogan of no one will be left behind in a more exclusive and radical way. In this context, I discussed the challenge and opportunities of a just transition of agriculture in North Africa to propose a kind of people's-based just transition in agriculture. Uh, the agriculture policy in North Africa uh, went through three main stages. The post-colonial period, was characterized by an increase in the state rules in supporting the agriculture sector. And then in 70s and 80s, North African countries 
were reducing the role of the state, supporting the transformation, the transition to agribusiness and export-led agriculture. And these go with a marginalization of small farmers and rural population. Uh, it's clear that during this period where we live now, it's uh, uh, within a new liberal uh, agri agriculture policy, the promise of market-based food security in the region is not attained. And the actual food, agriculture, and the ecologi ecological crisis, uh, ecological system are in crisis. Uh, now we talk about how the trade agreement with Europe have evolved since 2004 and uh, after two, 2011, uh, the European Union proposed, uh, uh, proposed a deep and comprehensive free trade ag agreement to support improving the agriculture export uh, capacity in North African countries. Uh, reaching Europe standards and facilitating the access of uh, Southern product to the European, European market. Uh, Europe policy also focused on supporting development through trade. And just as an example, when we look at the Egyptian case, uh, the vegetable and the fruits have been the main um, uh, agricultural exports to Europe. However, grain and sugar are imported from Europe to Egypt. The structure is presented here. Um, and to, to understand very well uh, who are the winners and losers of trade, we need to look at all food system elements in both sides, not only focus on macroeconomic uh, statistics, but look at all elements of a uh, food system. So we can see that the agriculture export for the from, from the region to Europe are high nutrition, nutritional value, and it's in the interest of the food transformation of Europe. The exported fruits and vegetables are labor and resource inten intensive product. And the trade organization increased the competition among North African countries to access the European market. On the contrary, European wheat and sugar product do not support the food transformation of the region. Just I give another example from Egypt. Although Egypt is considered as a success story in the export, the rate of malnutrition among ch children raised to a level similar to a country emerged from civil war. It's about 31% of uh, children. And this, this, uh, this number is according to uh, FPRI report out in 2019. Uh, so uh, the trade agreement integrate regional agriculture in the European plan and agenda. The agenda was set by Europe and our and uh, the region country have to adopt with this agenda. While the policy in Europe support European farmers and the transformation of the Europe food system, for example, the cap represents 31% of the actual European budget, the agreement doesn't help transform transform the transformation of region food system into a sustainable system that uh, realized the farm to fork concept adopted by Europe for its citizen. The allocating water, land, energy, and labor power in order to produce vegetables and fruits for Europe keep this country's health and ecological crisis, crisis generated. So despite the crisis and the impact of trade on, 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 the, on the actual situation uh, of the food system in, in, in the region, uh, there is an accelerating growth in the restoration of local food system and the building of agroecological and regenerative agriculture practice. Like there is many organization 
in multi-level working in different aspects of agroecology. Uh, I give some examples like North African uh, Food Network, Food Sovereignty Networks, Organic Organization Association, and so on. We assume here that the building of a just transition depends on the ability of these actors and practice to develop network and the possibility of obtaining support. A regional just transition in agriculture requires delink it from European trade policy and agenda set by powerful actors, developing food sovereignty networks and ending the marginalization of small and medium farmers. Uh, to conclude, agriculture just transition is embedded into the desire and work of many people that need to be visible and to develop. This will not be going to done without supporting local food, local small farmer, rebuild the food system in local basis to replay to the local demand and need and problems. And finally, engaged in an exclusive global people, new green deal and global just transition that not leave really anyone behind. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anur, for these remarks. I hope uh, we are seeing each other again. Uh, I want to welcome in our webinar also the uh, MEP Joachim Schuster and uh, Daniel Buda, who are following the debate. Uh, I also want to welcome the former chair of the International Trade Committee in the European Parliament, Helmut Markov and a lot of other representatives of civil society organizations here in Brussels accompanying these, um, how to say, shaping of the bilateral relationship EU-Africa, for example, Mark Mays and Jane Nalunga from Seatini in Uganda. So it is okay that we ha have such a wide range of followers and, and, and visitors to our webinar, because there is, of course, a, a key challenge to all of us, coming from the decision of the African Union to set up the African um, continental free trade area. And the CFTA has, of course, to play a significant role uh, in the future, or in the shaping of the future relationship between the European Union and, um, and um, African countries, including the North African region. And therefore, I would uh, like to invite uh, Engineer Mansour Ahmed, Chairman of the Pan-African Manufacturers Association, the PARMA, to come in with his contribution to our debate on trade and Africa's industrialization agenda. What role for the EU, what role for the AFCFTA you see? <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Helmut. I hope we can all hear me. Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, the Pan-African Manufacturers Association, as its name implies, is a platform which is supported by the African Union Commission and other African institutions uh, aimed at, prom at working with the AFCFTA, the African uh, Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, in order to promote one of the key pillars of economic uh, success, which is uh, the um, growth of the African manufacturing sector. I believe that it does not require any extensive uh, research to define, to determine that today, in today's economy, value addition or value creation through transformation of materials into products is indeed the basis of wealth creation and therefore the creation of uh, uh, prosperity for people. And trade, in fact, uh, cannot be said to be um, fair and equitable unless the trading partners enjoy uh, increasing value creation in their territories as a result of the trade and economic relations. To that extent, I think if we now look back on the relationship between Europe and Africa in terms of economic relations and trade, it is very clear. 
that the intra Afri the Africa European trading relationship and indeed general economic relationship ha cannot be said to be a fit for purpose in the sense that clearly um, the parties involved in the relationship have not gained uh, have not been able to develop increasing value addition uh, in order to grow their economies to grow wealth and therefore to develop their, 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 their to create human development for the people. And I think that is the major objective of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, to do two things. First of all, to ensure that within Africa, as we all know, um, the different 54, 55 different countries in Africa have acted in um, almost independent and often um, conflicting relationship in terms of their economic activities. And we don't want to go into the history of that, but it is clear that given the resources available to the various countries, given the dynamics of economic, of today's economic activity, it is only through a more collaborative and cooperative uh, relationship within Africa that the um, value creation in the various territories and countries of Africa can be significantly enhanced, and therefore the economies of these territories can be significantly um, um, uh, uh, enhanced. And in addition to that, of course, um, economic, the economic position or the position of Africa in the global economic um, uh, setup, and particularly in global trade, clearly has simply not been uh, commensurate with the potential of Africa's contribution to and and uh, to global uh, wealth creation and certainly uh, to the needs of of its people. Now, I think we all know now today that given the today's dynamics, especially with regards to the um, uh, um, with regards to to the mm -hmm. distribution of um, the global community with regards to, uh, I'm trying to catch the word, um, um, with regards to growth of population, it is clear that Africa presents both a huge challenge, but also a huge opportunity, not just for Africa, but for the world as a whole. Because given the growing population and the demographics, the global demographics today, if Africa continues to lag behind, it means the increasingly more productive young population of Africa will be unable to make the contribution to the growth of global wealth and, and global prosperity. Indeed, will remain a burden to the global uh, um, population. Now, such burden, of course, especially in the light of the fact that other regions, especially in Europe, uh, the demographic is headed in the, in the different direction. What will create a more positive uh, trajectory is, a, is, is, an, is an arrangement which enables the, a, a, the a, the older, the aging population of rural to work more closely with the younger population of Africa in order to boost the productivity of, uh, of, of the global population or of the, region, of the population of the two regions. So I believe that if we start with this um, uh, assumption that trade and economic relations over the past uh, the perhaps century between Europe and Africa if it continue, if they continue on the basis of the present trend, the, tra the present trajectory, we see that value will be con will continue to be increased and created in Europe, for instance, uh, whereas the pace of development of capacity to create value in Africa will continue to decline. And yet, this is the region that has that will have the mm -hmm. demographics to increase. The, populate, the, the capacity of both regions. So uh, the, I am, the, African, uh, the uh, African Manufacturing Association is set to, propose, to promote the rebalancing of this trading agreement. That means continuing relationship between Europe and Africa must target 
increase in value creation in Africa through, and today value creation is mostly through increase in manufacturing and industrialization. So to that extent, it's in Europe's interest to work with Africa to grow the capacity of Africa to increase overall productivity and production. So value chain, uh, um, if you like, harmonization, or what some people say, value chain integration, which enables more value to be created in Africa in the context of the current overall relationship of the development value chains between Africa and Europe must be re-targeted and re-engineered to create more value in Africa. And I think this simply means we must look at how we invest across the, the two continents. We must look at um, what capacities and um, what would be the dynamics of this joint investment. Um, I believe there have been discussions on reviewing the investment code in Africa, and this is part of the AFCFTA uh, um, uh, goals, in a way that enables Europe and Africa to continue to invest, especially to continue to grow investment in Africa in a way that moves us in the direction of greater value creation in Africa, in, therefore improving the manufacturing capacity, both in terms of its uh, um, uh, uh, technology level, as well as in terms of scale. Because clearly trade uh, happens between countries uh, when perhaps the scale of output of both countries in the items in which they trade and they exchange are to a large extent more equitable. To that extent, what we see as very necessary in the coming uh, decades is that uh, an ecosystem or to create a, um, a framework for relationships that enhances the contribution of African nations and African people to the overall productivity of the two regions. And I think it is in this context that I see the need for significant re-engineering and reconstruction of the EU-Africa relation, economic relations as well as trade relations. Now, there are many ways in which this can be done, of course. First, simply by African countries uh, looking at relationships um, that will engender increasing value creation irrespective of where the investment is coming from. I think this is why perhaps so many people are now looking at the China-African relationship as a model. I personally don't think it's a good model, but I think in the circumstances where more investment, for instance, coming from that region is going into value creating activities, uh, will probably be more productive, more, more, more positive to Africa than in the, in the current relationship, which has for many, many decades uh, created a situation where the manufacturing capacities the capacity in Africa is based on a model that today we see as fill and finish. And I think the current concern with the COVID uh, vaccine has clearly created this issue, that if we want a, 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 an increase in prosperity for both Europe and Africa, we must move from fill and finish as a model of manufacturing and industrialization a new model where we actually um, exchange value at different points of the value chain. Let me give a quick example just to highlight what I'm trying to say. Um, copper. Copper is uh, produced in, say, the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. Nigeria has one of the largest uh, um, copper wire or copper cable production capacities in Africa. Now, what is happening today is that Nigeria is not able to get maximum value from its capacity because it is now relying on import of say, copper rods or even uh, um, the, the earlier uh, product that goes to produce copper rods called copper cathode and 
ultimately the uh, capacity, the, the value in copper cable is significantly less than it can gain if it is also producing copper rods and perhaps cathode. Now, Congo Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the major producers of uh, copper ore in, in the world. Yet, its copper ore is being shipped out to other, other regions at just the ore level. And this is 20% of the value of uh, the, the copper industry. Now, if, for instance, we can create an investment code that allows more investment in Congo Republic, for instance, in producing the uh, the copper cathode or the produce the copper cable Congo and in the value created in able to produce copper cables that indeed will compete globally and be able to bring the price of copper cable down and we know today that the demand for copper cables is particularly if we look at the way modern transport technology is going with electric cars and so on and so forth. So to that extent, there is still tremendous uh, advantage for Europe if this value chain uh, restructuring is done in a way that So I think we have lost you. Can you repeat? At the um, to copper uh, copper more value, and the next in copper rod to to copper lower cost and lower price. And again, from this value chain, that going forward, and in Africa, really would need to work together to direct policies and regulatory practices in such a way that this kind of new value chain integration uh, is, is, is enabled. And I believe this is where, in my view, trade and relationships, economic relationships between Europe and Africa will be the most beneficial for both parties. Indeed, I think one can go beyond, Af beyond Europe and Africa. Uh, I believe that a more equitable, a more equitable trade, a more equitable value chain integration across the globe will, in fact, be perhaps the most one of the most uh, sensible developments in uh, the in the global economy. Because by doing that, we're going to create an increasing capacity, not only in terms of value, increasing capacity to to create employment and more, more meaningful employment and this will be uh, an advantage for all parties if we do that okay if, if we take one issue that is it will now create okay, of younger African people going into Europe can now stay in Africa thank you very much thank you very much uh, unfortunately we had some some problems with the communication. So sometimes we had lost your explanation how the value chain have to be uh, shaped. But probably we come back to this uh, in the further debate. Um, um, and uh, I would just now invite uh, Maha Ben Gada uh, from the economic program of the Luxembourg Foundation office in Tunis to give us some, how to say it, understanding about how to achieve the economic and monetary sovereignty in the 21st century um, uh, Africa. And uh, I want to announce already that we have a distinguished guest with us also in this panel, uh, Mrs. Um, Nela Eichhorn from GGG Trade of the EU Commission. She is head of the unit Southern Neighbors, Middle East, Turkey, Russia, and Central Asia. And she has been ready to give us a first short reply, how to say it, uh, answer to all the three um, introductory um, uh, speeches and uh, 
briefings and so that we can afterwards come into the debate. So uh, Maha, uh, the floor is yours. You have to unmute. Thank you very much, Helmut. It's my pleasure to be with you to discuss on this issue. I would like to thank the European Parliament and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, my colleagues in Brussels for having invited me uh, to, to this uh, discussion. Uh, I'm sorry I will switch to French because I'm more fluent in French, so I will uh, better express myself. So I will let you just the time to switch the, the channel. Donc, euh, je vais, euh, je vais, euh, j'ai intitulé ma présentation. My uh, presentation uh, bears the title uh, "Regaining Economic and Monetary Sovereignty in the 21st Century Africa." We need for that a change in the investment and the trade relation between the EU and Africa, and I hope that in the course of the ensuing uh, discussion, uh, we will. Uh, uh, try and uh, hear more the uh, voice of the uh, population in civil in the, the civil population in African countries, so as to bring about a fairer uh, cooperation serving the interests of all, including those African people. I would like to start by saying this: Africa has the capacity to offer decent quality of life to all its inhabitants. We can offer universal public services, healthcare education, but also guarantee employment to uh, everyone who wants to stay in their home countries and work there and guarantee a social system with a decent income to vulnerable people and, and to those who cannot work for a variety of reasons. But the uh, problem of Africa is uh, dozens of years of uh, colonial, post-colonial dismemberment, as was uh, repeated uh, earlier on which has been exacerbated by economic liberalization, which has plunged African countries into a vicious circle, uh, which has been um, supported by a number of uh, structural problems. All the countries have their own specific situation. Algeria is not Ethiopia, Nigeria is not South Africa. But the most recurrent problems, which are um, a Damocles sword on the head of populations and their governments are the lack of uh, food sovereignty uh, today. As our colleague uh, very uh, uh, correctly uh, indicated, a lack of uh, food sovereignty in all African countries, and especially in uh, the uh, countries of uh, Northern Africa, a lack of energy sovereignty, and uh, as uh, was indicated a, a moment ago, manufacturing industries and extractive industries with uh, uh, low value added are part of an international division of labor, which is uh, actually based on uh, low wage labor, very often female labor, and uh, with intellectual property being uh, kept in uh, the global north to such an extent that there was not an adequate transfer of technology with the impossibility for African countries to catch up. Uh, there is also a lack of um, monetary sovereignty. That's the fourth point. So the development model has been based on extractive industries, on the export of raw materials, on tourism and on foreign direct investments. A number of uh, African countries, including Tunisia, have uh, chosen to use that development route by uh, liberalizing their trade and investment. Uh, we use uh, uh, low-value manufacturing industries. We export some agricultural produce, such as uh, olive oil uh, or citrus uh, fruits. Um, but we offer a lot of advantageous uh, conditions to private investors, which reduces the uh, tax income of countries and which puts all our African countries in competition between themselves. Uh, they uh, may be uh, at times uh, blacklisted by European countries as uh, uh, being engaged in uh, tax uh, dumping. The condition is very low wages, very poor working conditions. The countries end up having to subsidize um, 
commodities in order to try and guarantee uh, a minimum living standard to their low-paid citizens. We also need to borrow in foreign currencies in order to artificially uh, stabilize the national currency. Indebtedness is a way to uh, cope with the uh, um, lack of balance, uh, of a trade balance, but caused by the uh, overarching model uh, where uh, products are being exported to the north. And of course, the debt is uh, very much uh, supported by the uh, creditors um, using a number of terms and conditions which reinforce the uh, structural status quo uh, based on austerity policies. And such austerity policies are cut in subsidies, pressure on wages, uh, privatizing uh, utilities, uh, an unfair taxation which uh, affects populations more than companies, such policies create economic and social exclusion and increase the poverty rate, the crime rate, and uh, lead those populations to engage in, in the informal economy uh, to move out and to migrate to uh, European countries in search of a better life. And so those countries need uh, to come up with a security solution um, and are increasingly involved in, in police and enforcement work with the support um, in terms of consulting, but also in terms of equipment from the north. A number of uh, European countries uh, have uh, used of this uh, setup uh, for quite a number of years. For France, Italy, Germany and Spain, uh, it is a, a very uh, profitable uh, business uh, model, especially uh, after the establishment of the Common Agricultural Policy and the Association Agreement and the establishment of quota systems and the increase in non-tariff barriers, African countries had to specialize in the products uh, which do not meet the need for basic income, which do not meet the requirement for economic development. They will export uh, uh, shrimps, uh, oysters, coffee, olive oil, um, citrus fruits. Uh, some countries are in a very bad situation in terms of the uh, water management. Um, drought is a problem and they need to import uh, uh, feed, uh, but also weed, gas, uh, fuel, industrial components in order to uh, fuel their economy and continue um, day in, day out to feed their populations. And after 2011, after the revolutions, because the question was asked uh, where we stand, uh, after the uh, Dignity Revolution, where well, we hoped that things would have changed. The same answer was uh, provided by Europe and especially by the European Commission in terms of the free trade, the deep and comprehensive uh, free trade agreements. Those uh, free trade agreements were very much in favour of Europe, uh, guaranteeing a, a good protection of IPR for uh, Europe, imposing European standards without assessing the costs and consequences on local producers. And of course, the consequences in terms of food sovereignty, the uh, liberalization of uh, the energy uh, sector, especially access to the uh, renewable energy market for European companies in order for uh, that energy to be exported to Europe, which of course doesn't serve our own problem in terms of the energy deficit which we continue to suffer. And of course, uh, borders are uh, increasingly closed. Uh, Security-based collaboration between countries is uh, based on the protection of security interests in Europe and not on the needs of populations. And it's true to say that the uh, discussions on new free trade agreements have stopped thanks to the mobilization of civil society because of a change uh, in the uh, power balance. But that logic, which I have uh, just uh, uh, repeated, uh, remains very much present in any cooperation agreement, uh, which is considered today in any sort of macro uh, financial assistance. Those underlying terms and conditions continue to exist before any bilateral or multilateral agreement is adopted. But officially, the um, what uh, the Commission is saying is uh, uh, very much uh, the, the promotion of new quotas, uh, out of quota, olive oil granted to Tunisia recently, um, 
less than 4% of those uh, quotas actually uh, came to uh, benefit Tunisia. The Commission is uh, mentioning a number of uh, amounts promised for development aid, but not money which is actually paid to those countries. Uh, a lot is being said about uh, the uh, democratic success story, uh, job promotion and the uh, SDGs uh, and uh, the need uh, to develop a, a peace and prosperity area. But the day-to-day -day reality for the population on the ground is very far removed from those aspirations. I would just give you a few figures uh, to uh, make my case. Between 2015 and 2030, 39,000 engineers and 3,300 doctors left Tunisia. Uh, the main uh, country of departure was uh, France. 70% uh, said that the uh, conditions of work were inadapted locally. Uh, a lot said that there was a lack of security in hospitals. Uh, and a third reason given by those uh, leaving the country was uh, uh, poor wages and salaries. So austerity as opposed by all cooperation agreements, all loan agreements or all microfinance agreements in by the F IMF, uh, uh, all of those terms and conditions have actually driven down uh, the uh, country, that austerity has had an impact on the provision of decent public services. In the last uh, 10 years, between 10 to 15,000 nurses left uh, Tunisia, going especially to Germany. Uh, in uh, June, July 2021, over 20,000 uh, people died uh, due to a, a lack of money to buy vaccines, a lack of beds, a lack of oxygen and a lack of staff in public hospitals. It's only after the crisis, uh, after those numbers reached such proportions, that Afri European countries um, provided help under the uh, COVAX initiative. I can give you other examples. Despite the uh, lockdown which was imposed by the government last year, women uh, working in uh, industrial areas were forced to continue to work uh, in exporting industries, especially uh, uh, in uh, a French um, curtain uh, factory, simply because it was decided that exporting uh, companies are essential uh, industries for the national economy. And this created a peak in the uh, uh, contamination levels in that city. Uh, the uh, uh, female um, uh, divers uh, collecting clams and uh, oysters uh, continue to work at extremely low wages. They get eight dinners for eight hours a day. This is not enough to buy one litre of olive oil. This is not enough to buy one uh, tin of uh, preserved uh, tomatoes. Even though we pr we produce olive oil, we produce uh, tomatoes locally, uh, we cannot actually afford uh, those uh, produce locally simply because the cost is too high. And uh, despite the ruling of the uh, Italian Council of State on the uh, question of the illegally imported waste from Italy to Tunisia between May and July 2020, uh, and this affected 282 containers, 7,800 tons of uh, uh, prohibited waste. Uh, despite that uh, ruling, which uh, imposed on Italy to uh, retrieve those uh, waste uh, quantities within uh, uh, within two, 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 two months, uh, nothing has been done ever since, and such waste continues to pollute the country. In terms of brain drain, in addition to brain drain, we also suffer from uh, immigration as a whole and the way Europe is managing clandestine immigration. 15,000 Tunisian nationals uh, left Italy uh, using a sea route in the first months of uh, 2021, but 20,000 uh, people from sub-Saharan Africa uh, crossed our borders uh, during the same year. And those are only figures to give you an order of magnitude and to tell you to what extent the situation is actually deteriorating in our countries in terms of further pressure on working conditions, in terms of uh, uh, lower wages, in terms of uh, a worsening of the environmental crisis, with all attendant consequences. Uh, there is an increased brain drain, and of course the government uh, 
does not know what to do uh, to deal with the situation. The uh, COVID pandemic again highlighted the underlying economic problems of Africa. And I do believe that the uh, post-pandemic recovery can only be sustainable if we look at the structural problems and uh, tackle those structural problems head on. By way of a conclusion, I would say that the responsibility of Africa is, of course, to stop that sort of economic development model, which is based on leveling down uh, in order to uh, outcompete your neighbor. Uh, regional partnerships within the continent must rest on coordinated investment patterns in order to uh, develop horizontal uh, ties in strategic issues, healthcare, transport, telecoms, renewable energies, research and development, but also education across the continent. The responsibility of Europe is to realize that the uh, extractive, extraction-based uh, economic development model has failed. And a new model needs to be adopted based on a true partnership with technology transfers. One needs to be more selective in terms of, of uh, foreign direct investments. Uh, tax benefits uh, should not be mainstreamed. Uh, not everything must be liberalized, but there should be a real collaboration stressing uh, the local needs and meeting the local needs of partners. We also need uh, uh, to uh, prioritize ecotourism, uh, the uh, uh, development of the uh, local heritage, and uh, safe uh, agricultural practices. We also need to develop um, the monetary side uh, with the consolation of uh, sovereign debts. It is important to mobilize uh, Africa's resources, uh, and this would be made possible uh, by cancelling the debt. The objective then should be to uh, develop uh, uh, full employment policies as opposed to austerity policies. We need to come up with uh, uh, public education, sustainable agriculture, renewable energy uh, infrastructure. And then, in terms of uh, uh, resources, uh, they should be uh, dedicated to the management of natural resources, uh, and uh, we should uh, make sure that we empower especially the youth and the women and i would like to uh, uh, pay tribute to the uh, ep resolution in march 2021 on the new eu africa strategy and the uh, partnership for sustainable and inclusive uh, development uh, taking into uh, consideration the objectives of uh, the african union and the eu but i would like to uh, caution that uh, any debt cancellation initiative can only be efficient if there is a real coordination between uh, all multilateral creditors and private creditors. And those initiatives uh, cannot simply be conditioned on new austerity measures. The aspirations of local populations must be taken into consideration including uh, decent public services, uh, decent employment conditions, and uh, decent living uh, conditions for all. This is the uh, message I wanted to uh, stress uh, uh, today, and I would be uh, very happy to engage in a future discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the very interesting figures you have provided. So if you agree, um, Mrs. Uh, Aishon, I would invite you to give a first maybe a comment um, um, concerning the, these remarks from the region. So how do you see um, challenges towards the commission and the DG trade in particular to answer this question? And probably there is a lot of questions among us or within the chat. I will come back then to this debate opportunity. I would also have some, some questions already uh, summarized, but first, um, uh, Mrs. Aisha, floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much and good evening to all. Um, I especially thank you to the speakers uh, before me uh, for, for their very insightful interventions. So indeed, as Mr. Scholz suggested, I will say then a few words about the state of trade and investment relationship. Um, just to say, besides, of course, the close proximity and historical uh, relations, 
the countries uh, of North Africa are very important trading partners uh, for the EU um, with almost uh, 110 billion euros of trading goods um, going uh, between us in 2020. The five North African countries actually account for almost half of the whole EU trade with the African continent. So that's sizable. It's, it's, it's integrated. <laughs> um, uh, economically, uh, the deployment uh, of value chains between the EU and North Africa is, is supported and facilitated by the network of uh, free trade areas, uh, which form part of the association agreements. These uh, free trade areas, uh, they date back to over two decades. Um, they have opened two-way trade in industrial goods and also in many cases also for agriculture products. So also the participation of North African countries in the pan-Euromed uh, system of accumulation uh, for rules of origin. This has also been very important uh, for, for the closer integration and, and this, uh, this integration has benefited all sides. So, um, as I said, the trade in goods with the fourth, uh, with a, with the North African countries with which the EU has um, uh, these uh, agreements has increased by 30% between 2009 and 2019. So, of course, there is a large untapped potential, um, which then points uh, to the need to, uh, to modernize uh, the relationship in trade and investment. Um, just to sort of uh, factually uh, underpin this, uh, the, the European Commission published um, a staff working document uh, which, uh, which took stock of, uh, of an exposed evaluation. So it was conducted, the exposed evaluation was conducted to, to look at how the trade chapters of the, of the six um, Euro-Mediterranean association agreements have actually delivered. So it looked also at Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, and Algeria, for instance. Uh, the evaluation stated that uh, these trade areas have overall delivered quite well in terms of achieving their objectives. But they also, the evaluation also showed that uh, there, are, there would be more benefits available uh, if, uh, if uh, the trade arrangements between us uh, would cover non-tariff measures, regulatory aspects, sustainable development, investment and services. So, so there is scope for modernization. Uh, also on investment side, um, uh, it showed that uh, there are some success stories of investments uh, in these countries, but there is potential for, for much more coming from the EU. Uh, investments that would then support sustainable green digital transition, but also investments in manufacturing. So what, what, what has the EU done recently? Um, well, last year um, was a year of, of strategic framework uh, of, of funding uh, being put in place. Um, the Commission has issued, uh, the European Commission has issued two important documents back in February um, that put the region in a specific focus. So I'm talking here about the EU trade policy review uh, of February. Which, uh, which then was uh, sort of jointly and synergetically developed uh, with a joint communication on renewed partnership on southern neighborhood. So both these documents offered to modernize trade and investment relationship with interested partners. Very recently, importantly, uh, also a new European global gateway strategy was launched uh, by the, by the uh, EU. So this looks to boost also the sustainable links and connections uh, around the world, um, looking in the areas of transport, digital health, climate and energy, but also in education and research. So, so this strategy is yet to, yet to be implemented, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's important. Recently, we are also, as the Commission, stepping up implementation and enforcement of our trade agreements. Um, so this enforcement action is, is important, uh, not only to defend uh, the interest, but also to ensure that, that the economic operators find uh, predictable and transparent conditions um, of trading, of investing. Um, so, so this is also important for, for, for new economic cooperation uh, in priority areas such as digital and green transition, in health and novel ways of of agriculture and production um, of food and food security. Um, as you know, 
there is the work ongoing and the intention really to associate the North African countries in EU's uh, farm to fork strategy. So this links, links very well here as well. And finally, I believe uh, it was referred to already, but uh, we have also stepped up the cooperation uh, uh, with North African countries in the context of the uh, regional work in, uh, in the Union for the Mediterranean. Um, this, uh, we have created a trade and investment platform at the senior officials level, basically a format to discuss issues like sustainability, trade, facilitation, um, investment climate reforms, and, and, and so forth. So, so this so more regional uh, discussion and, and, and cooperation forum uh, also sort of is revitalized last year. Uh, that said, uh, uh, we, we look forward to continuing close uh, engagement in bilateral and, and, and then more regional uh, formats. So thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Eichhorn. Uh, I mean, we have one challenge with the whole um, reporting, which we have, what is the reason for, for organizing also the series of webinars is that we have to focus on the trade and investment issues in a certain way, because we can't write from the International Trade Committee a report which is covering all the aspects. But of course, we have to include all the problems and, 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 and challenges in our thinking when we are dealing with this challenge of reshaping the economic relationship. And that leads me to one key question to our uh, speakers, in particular from the from, from the continent, with the project of the AFCFTA, there is of course the orientation that you have to strengthen the intra-African and by that also the intra-regional cooperation, linkages, infrastructure uh, constructing, etc. So, if we are looking on that point. So how we can, from your experience, from your views, what you have just uh, told us about the need for reshaping the value chain, for, for having a different orientation of investments for, for healthcare, for education, etc. So how we are organizing the, the uh, or we, how we are supporting the reorganization of the responsibility of the stakeholders who has to, to do this, political ones, economic ones in the region. So of course, uh, there could be an addressing that uh, the bilateral relationship between EU and Africa is interfering in this ability because there is a traditional trade and uh, com commercial cooperation but of course, we have to understand how we are redirecting the, these, uh, I would say, vertical um, links to a more horizontal linkage between your countries. So would you think that the approach which has been expressed in a hearing of the trade committee with, um, on the same problems with the Secretary General of the AF, uh, AFCFTA Secretary, Mr. Ramkele Mene, when he said that the foremost task of econ economic transformation in the African context is a transformation of the system of production from a dominated by primary extractions, what you have referred to in your uh, introductory remarks and then uh, contributions, uh, and low value agriculture and services towards an um, 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 system in which high value is added through the application of technology, innovation, and better linkage between the sectors in the wider economy. So the question would be then, where is the money coming from? So who is investing, who is contributing to this reorientation? So what youth therefore would demand probably from us, from Europeans and other third country um, uh, responsible political and economic uh, responsible uh, decision makers in addressing this question. Do you need grants? Do you need investments? Because any investor coming to your country 
being in Tunisia, being in Algeria, being in, in Morocco, expects, of course, also an environment where he finds uh, conditions worth to, to invest. So I think this is a, one of the crucial points we have to discuss very frankly and openly. And I'm fully share your demands to us that we have to rethink very deeply how we are shaping this relationship. And, and that we have also to overcome a certain um, traditional economic thinking. So we have to introduce maybe other criteria. And I found a very interesting book just recently published, um, uh, Economic and Monetary Sovereignty in the 21st Century Africa. Um, and I can only recommend everybody to read this book because there are a lot of very interesting figures at first, but of course also thoughts and proposals how, how to answer this question I raised. So maybe you can, you can come back to, to this question. Uh, so what, what we, how we have to deal with, this, uh, with the stakeholders, political ones of, of, at both continents, because they will meet next week in Paris and the huge investment package will be probably adopted or put on the way. So what does that mean? Who is deciding on the direction of the investments? Who is in a transparent way participating in the control and the scrutiny about the investment from both sides? So I think maybe that is for the beginning uh, crucial questions I would raise for our webinar. I don't know exactly who wants to come in. Um, can I, can I? Yeah, please, please, Mr. Thank the first. Yes. Well, I, I, I am sure I missed some of the issues you said, but I, I understand particularly from the last statement, in, in terms of the responsibility for ensuring that the um, reshaping of uh, economic relations and trade, uh, actually, in my view, rests with uh, both Africa and Europe. And I think this is where policy and regulatory practices can indeed uh, help to reshape trade. Now, you yourself have mentioned, and I think this is absolutely essential, that the traditional thinking, the IMF World Bank thinking of investment, really, we, we must re, it must be re-examined. I believe that there is now a clear basis for identifying a new value that will come into the computations of investment. And that is the value of global prosperity as a whole. And I've said before that any investment that increases inequality and increases poverty at any, in, any, in any location actually creates a, 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 a negative um, factor in the computation. So I believe this is the core, in my view, uh, thinking that must now be perhaps contributed, particularly by our universities and our professors, to find how do we incorporate this additional value into our computations so that investment assessment, investment evaluation can actually take account of this very important, uh, very important factor. I, I believe that's probably the contribution I can make here. Thank you. Uh, Maha, you wanted to come in? Uh, oui, uh, c'est une question uh, très Yes, important. thank you. It's an important question. Where is the money coming from? Uh, the money can only be collected when there is value creation. Money can be uh, spent uh, by any state or public authority if uh, there is going to be an increase in the uh, uh, value added chain, but there is a linkage between economic and monetary sovereignty. But when the money needs to be borrowed in order to uh, reimburse the debt or in order uh, to fund the profits which are going to be channeled out of the country, then it becomes a constraint for the country and it becomes impossible uh, to properly allocate that money towards uh, uh, beneficial investments uh, as far as the local populations are concerned. 
Uh, one talks of uh, the primary deficit, but what about the uh, trade balance? I'm talking about the uh, IMF when they uh, make recommendations. They say that the primary deficit needs to come down. Uh, you need to stop um, uh, spending. You need to stop investment uh, budgets. You need to uh, cut down on your operating uh, budget. So such austerity policies do not give states the possibility to spend in order to create value to create wealth and to be able to then reinvest in strategic investments. Uh, there was, I believe, a, a, a German proposal of the uh, compact with Africa, uh, and it was all about investments uh, which would be generated by public-private partnerships. But as we know, very often such public-private partnerships which would incite, encourage uh, private investors to chip in and uh, put some money uh, on the ground to develop infrastructure projects, for instance. We know that uh, such uh, projects are actually a way for uh, private investors uh, to, uh, well, basically collect a number of benefits, uh, but the less lucrative uh, part uh, is uh, actually left over to states who uh, will be uh, having to pay the rent, as it were, for the uh, foreseeable future. So legislation is really important. Because when, uh, well, I, I, I had a number of discussions uh, about uh, macro uh, financial assistance, which comes with a number of terms and conditions. Uh, one needs to liberalize the uh, agri-food sector or uh, changes have to be made to uh, phytosanitary rules. Uh, I, I learned that the European Parliament uh, doesn't necessarily have their say on such memorandums of understanding where, you know, um, the fine print is being negotiated in terms of uh, conditions for African countries to receive the money from the uh, EU. And as a representative of the uh, African civil society, we are happy to participate. Uh, we are happy to uh, say what we believe uh, uh, doesn't work, but we always end up having to deal with governments that apply to the letter the uh, loan conditionalities that have been negotiated and imposed uh, to them, simply because they are uh, under the constraint of having to uh, cut down their primary uh, deficit and having to reimburse the debt, and they have no maneuvering room. So I do believe that there is a uh, a power a problem. The balance of power is a, a real problem today. Let's take the look of uh, Tunisia. A lot of pressure is uh, being uh, uh, brought to bear on UGTT uh, to accept, uh, to uh, agree to a reform plan with the IMF. They do know that the um, only way uh, to uh, push against austerity is by mobilizing the working class and the trade unions. And so what's happening, there is a lot of pressure uh, being brought to bear on trade unions and trade unionists are being very much encouraged to accept a reform program uh, so that uh, we may get uh, IMF money. And uh, this is what we hear in the country. Unless we get a new agreement with the IMF, there will not be any uh, macro uh, financing assistance from the EU. There will be no bilateral agreement. There will be no loans from all partners. And in a few months' time, you will not be uh, able to import uh, wheat gas or further raw materials. So there is uh, a lot of power play, and it's very difficult today uh, to know how we can actually influence decision makers. Uh, today, of course, we know where the money may come from, but at the same time, it is important to understand who the money is going to benefit to. It, it should be money which is going to be very beneficial for Europe. It should also be beneficial for our countries. 
Uh, because if we fail to do so, we will have more political instability. We will have more populism. Uh, we will have more problems with uh, democracy or, and we will end up with a new um, a revolution. So I do believe that the situation is uh, extremely fragile uh, in the uh, country itself. This is all I can say about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ma. Merci uh, beaucoup, uh, Ma. Mr. Elnoué, you want to come in? J'ajouterais peut-être une, un petit élément, très rapidement. Je suis tout à fait d'accord avec uh, ce que Ma vient de nous dire. Money, but what this money do in the local mm. economy? Actually, we are stuck with the, with the macroeconomical analysis and understanding of issue that block our uh, sociological uh, or more uh, uh, socio-analytical uh, approach to understand how, what type of investment we need, uh, what the investment do in the local level. And uh, if we accept a kind of investments that increase the austerity policy and decrease the working class condition and facilitate the money circulation and not the people circulation, it's not a really investment. So we can, we have to challenge the, the board of investment. We, we will not go that, yes, we need more investment, but we have to ask what type of investment, why we need investment and how we can rebuild a new economy. Because if we continue all the way as business as usual, all the problem that we are stuck in now will be continued. So we will search more money to ameliorate our uh, political economy figures, to lend um, more money from World Bank and FME. And it's, it's a versus circle, actually. So it, it, investment, why and for do what exactly? And this is, for me, more important question. We have to pull all European and, and our own country. That's it. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I, I fully agree that, of course, the question of what, in which fields we have to invest, what is really the aim of investments for making your countries, countries maybe is also the wrong word, um, your citizens and their representatives in the different uh, levels of governance in the, in the countries, able to decide what is the priority task? So if I look in, into a, a research work by the Peace Research Institute of Frankfurt, the Leibniz Institute, uh, is asking the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis and its management in the Maghreb, Maghreb uh, is titled, is a worse yet to come. So they, they are describing a little bit similar to that what, what Maha just uh, explained that the, the, the departure of medical um, persons out of the countries, the inability to get vaccines, the inability to really to take responsibility for the healthcare in the situation where we are in, leads of course by a distrust in the political stakeholders to deliver and just increases uh, the, 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 the potential drivers of radicalization. So because the radi these radical actors can benefit from the several social economic crisis emerging from the COVID-19 crisis. So if we are not looking even for a such, how to say, uh, near reached task that is not even sp speaking about the, the question of building up the, the educational system as, um, uh, Mansour has said just to be able to create jobs on an on a, on a educated and, 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 and trained basis for, for, for um, contribute to the diversification of the, of the industrial manufacturer production in, in different goods or what you said, said um, Sarah, about the agricultural challenges, the agri-food um, uh, value chain. So then I think it's really, uh, really pro problematic. And here we have to take responsibility in shaping the bilateral relations. So if the European Union is not picking up this question as one of the 
burning points where we have to to bring in our uh, support also in a, in a way that we have to understand even if you're investing without a direct economic outcome or profit by stake by by by, by economic uh, operations in the momentum but in the long term it is you invest in stability it is beneficial yeah so i mean this is this is a problem and probably it should be one of the crucial points from my point of view in the forthcoming eu summit and we have tomorrow in the european parliament a meeting of european parliamentarians sitting Uh, in the pan, um, uh, in the joint parliamentary committee, uh, European Parliament, Pan African Parliament, uh, as a pre summit, we have to discuss such questions there as well. So that the, the parliament's taking also a scrut scrutiny responsibility in dealing with what is foreseen by the governments of the member states of the European Union, by the EU institutions, by the African Union, and the African member states. So, I mean, we have directly to turn to those who are responsible for decision making on this issue. Mm -hmm. And that is what also. You say, sorry. Yeah. Which is exactly what I said that policymakers in both Europe and Africa have to take responsibility yeah. for designing policies that shape the new investment regulation and new investment code. Now, you see, when perhaps um, the a developed world recognized that environment is a key uh, component of development and that until we do something about, for instance, the deteriorating uh, climate situation, issues like carbon tax is now incorporated in investment decision making. Now, why can't we in the same way incorporate issues? Can you can you please repeat? It does not understand the investment that outside Africa anyway must be. Hello. Yeah, please repeat. It was there was yes, a yes. break in the communication. I'm saying that. Yeah, I'm saying that in the same way that we have now introduced carbon tax. Uh, in, in, in order to improve overall climate situation uh, and incorporated it in our decision making for investment. It is also, in my view, makes sense to incorporate poverty tax, which means any investment that actually helps to reduce poverty actually should have a credit. And, and that will create a tendency for investors across from wherever to now go for investment that reduce poverty uh, as part of the computations of making this investment. And this is, uh, this is a policy matter. In Europe and in Africa can get together and agree on this matter. And I think this is how policy and regulation by, by actors, by the sector and public sector. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that is, of course, uh, in line with uh, certain suggestions and proposals included in the, in the report on the Africa, um, African strategy. Um, so, I mean, we have, of course, to link the different tools we are uh, we are discussing and we are adopting in the European Parliament, trying to show a certain new approach for shaping this bilateral relationship. Um, but of course, that is of, uh, then also linked to the, to the readiness of our partners in the African countries, in the African Union, um, to conclude an agreement or uh, to shape at least uh, the, the bilateral relations in that way that we are introducing obligatory new criteria for the question how we are investing, what are the conditions, what are the enforceable tools and mechanisms we have to, um, to apply. And that I think is a political battle and here we have, we have to, to do a lot. So, Mar, Mar you wanted to come in? Oui, je voulais, uh, je voulais donner juste yes, des... thank you. I simply uh, wanted to give you maybe a few ideas. Uh, if um, 
we are talking about investments. And if there is a, a tax credit given to foreign investors, well, at least, uh, well, if, for instance, you know, we're talking about renewable energies, uh, let's not say that, of course, you cannot export uh, what you have invested in, but you need at the same time not to export 100%. Let's make sure that uh, some of the renewable energy produced comes to benefit the local population. If you get a tax credit, if for 10 years you're not going to pay social security, you're not going to pay tax because you invest locally, at least you should be made to create jobs over the long term. Um, and the jobs with decent wages and salaries for uh, those workers. So you need to look at that sort of conditionality so that locally um, somebody is being given to the local community. And that needs to be enshrined in national legislation uh, because since uh, we got the um, IMF uh, program, we uh, ended up with a, an investment code which uh, liberalizes the uh, uh, the ball game, all advantages are being given to foreign investors. Uh, this is not limited at all. There is no responsibility imposed on foreign investors where they uh, come and invest. Uh, so it's a free for all for those investors. And it's very easy for them to move from one country to the other. I do believe that we need to integrate in the uh, legislation and in the uh, future discussions on um, investments in free trade agreements we need to have employment related objectives also linked to uh, decent working and living conditions for the local population and with technology transfers and with uh, an obligation to respect the environment it shouldn't be left to corporate social responsibility it should really be um, something which is enforceable in terms of terms and conditions under newly created uh, trade agreements or bilateral cooperation agreements. Thank you. So we have just uh, only three minutes left. So um, maybe I give once more the floor to Mrs. Eichhorn, if you want to come in once more to give a final comment. Uh, if you see the chance that we are shaping our our agreements in that way that we are introducing also in the, in the investment package um, or in the in the trade agreements um, uh, in the TSD chapters or maybe in all the chapters dealing with these challenges we have described today, uh, such uh, criteria and obligatory um, what is that benchmarks so that uh, from the political shaping of that. We are enforcing the corporations and, the, and uh, the, the actors in the economic area to, to really to deal with this challenge in our common interest of a, of a prosperous development of the, of the relationship between you and Africa. Well, thank you very much and, and really very briefly because, uh, because my, my role has, has been here to also listen and, and understand. Um, but I think I think on on, on the question concretely, um, indeed. I mean, I think the the EU uh, trade policy has 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 been evolving, and and I was mentioning before the uh, the trade strategy from February last year, which uh, which very much uh, owns owns up to 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 these responsibilities to the to the sustainable development uh, to to sustainable investment question. Um, so, so this is sort of the strategic orientation, and of course, of also the, um, the 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 mandate for for trade negotiations, the templates uh, that uh, that the EU uh, has when when it negotiates trade agreements and investment agreements, they are also constantly evolving, and 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 I think uh, and I think uh, these these messages and the request that uh, that you you have put forward today is is of course important to to take back. And, and, and uh, as I was saying uh, also before, I mean, the, the trading arrangements that are in place uh, with the North African countries right now, not with all of them, but most of them, they, they, they date back uh, a few decades. So, of course, there is scope for, for, for improvements, uh, for modernization. But it, it takes two sides to, to scope, to, to agree upon, you know, in what direction uh, these, these relationships should, should evolve. So I think this is precisely the discussion to be to be had. 
we cannot we cannot do this <laughs> do this alone. Thank you. Probably I can make a promise that the European Parliament will accompany this work and that we are continuing to include in our way of how we want to to analyze and to make conclusions for the political shaping of the relationship is these remarks and we are striving at least in the trade sector for a long time already for for TSD chapters in any agreement uh, for dealing with this task for, for rethinking what we're really doing so the, the clock is ticking um, we have eight years for the implementation of the SDGs we have only a few years to deal with the climate change problems or so environment, climate, biodiversity are all issues we have to deal with in our daily practices. And of course, the question of job creation, of education, of healthcare, of giving the young population uh, at both continents a uh, hope into, uh, into the future that they have a perspective to live in dignity in the, in the future, I think that is a common challenge we have. And here I see the responsibility also for, for introducing such ideas in the, in the trade policy, in the very concrete, hard economic um, um, facts and figures and, and to deal with that because here we, here we have a huge pot potential and a huge uh, uh, opportunity to, to participate in reshaping uh, this, these aspects. That leads me, uh, we are, have to close uh, the meeting. Unfortunately, uh, I want to thank very, very much all the panelists. Uh, I want to thank Ma Ben Gada. I want to thank Mansour Ahmed. I want to thank Saka El Nur and uh, also, of course, Nela Aishon for having participated in this debate. As usually, I ask you to forward any comments, further ideas contributions you made today in written form to us. We have, um, um, uh, we have um, made a, um, um, a recording of our webinar, but nevertheless, it's, sometimes it's good to have it in a written form because it gives us additional opportunities to, to stick to the one or the other point we found very interesting. And I want to announce it was the pre webinar in a series of four next Wednesday, mm -hmm. six o'clock yeah. in the evening, we are meeting again. If you want, uh, please feel invited. Then we are dealing with the problems, challenges, situation at the ground in the southern part of Africa. And again, we will probably have a very interesting and uh, far-reaching um, debate. Thank you very much. Stay safe, stay healthy, and see you soon. Solidarity. See you. And of course, thank you for the thank you for the interpretations, the interpreters who made it possible yeah, to listen to each yeah. other. And of course, also to the organizers, the Luxembourg Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you very much to the organizers. And thank you very much uh, for the bye bye for now. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you.